how to do scattering amplitudes in a better way, I guess. We've been working on, is this what you've been working on with NEMA? Yes, it's the notebook in progress. Oh, it's, oh, it's right there. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh, first, thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to come to, for me to come to Texas for the first time and give this talk and share with you some something that I've been learning with Nima in the recent months about uh, uh, another, uh, yet another way of thinking about gathering amplitudes. In particular, this is, uh, this is about lab, uh, loop levels. And this, in this talk, I'm going to talk to you, mainly focus on one loop, but uh, hopefully uh, we might get something that remarkable at higher loops even. Uh, so the general topic, the general target that we, uh, that we have is to try to understand better the structure of perturbative S matrix. So usually people just do uh, trying to figure out various efficient way to do the calculation in order to get a final function you, you obtain from doing any loop integrations. Of course, in general, the final diagram computation is hard. And so what people usually do is to first do a square decomposition into a base of integrals, each of which is simpler. And so after doing that, you compute the integral of each of the diagram and uh, we often that the result. And but the usually, even after you, after you complete the loop integral, there's always also a matter, uh, a problem of how to really optimize the information. So here I basically give you a an example at one loop, very, very, uh, very, very simple setup. That a uh, uh, so just a box integral in four dimensions. So already in this simple setup, uh, so just to set up the notation, all the uh, all the external legs that we're going to use here on that list, there is uh, momentum is going to zero, but instead. For all the four loop propagators, I'm going to put a small mass, the same mass n for them, in order to, uh, to get away from IR divergences, so to be safe. So what states are we considering? Are we considering oh, ones, or This is a, just a particular scalar integral. You can think about it as from a scalar theory. For scalar. Yeah, but, but the point is that in general, if you do, say, like gluon scattering or more general stuff, you can always figure out a way to decompose your whole amplitude onto a basis of scalar integrals. So the scalar integrals are kind of very fundamental object in all these kind of computations. And this is one particular diagram that you may want to compute in doing a, a very general a productive calculation. Yeah. So already for, for this example, so here is the result that I've written down grabbing from another some old papers. And it, first of all, you have to figure out a, uh, a smart way to optimize the data here. So the only variables entering are just in mass and the two metal stand variables in the two channel. And you define these variables and further <coughs> define the ratios and further define these beta variables, the three of them, depending on the U and the V, which are the ratios of the mass and the metal stand. And then the answer can be written in this nice way. However, there are still some problem here, <coughs> not a real problem, but a matter of fact uh, as follows. First of all, uh, in general, this, just this example is a function of transcendental wave two. However, the way that you can write this down is totally um, ambiguous because there's a very non-trivial set identity satisfied by the uh, transcendental uh, a function of transcendental wave two. There's a unique identity called five term identity. And so uh, there isn't a very unique way to write them down as compared to the normal functions. We can collect everything and train them. Another, perhaps a more, uh, another point which is, might, be, might be more inconvenient is that usually when we look at these functions and study the amplitude, the the, the most important thing that we care about is the similarity structure of the functions, mainly where are the branch points, where are the branch cut locates, and when it goes across the branch cut, what's the discontinuity associated to that? Because the, this information basically tells us where is the physical channel that for uh, real particle production. <coughs> However, if you look at this expression, 
uh, for example, for this log, it definitely indicates that there should be one point at the, at the point location where this argument and uh, being zero. However, although it appears to be here, that's actually a spurious point, a branch point. It's not the actual branch point of the whole, whole, uh, the whole integral that you compute. And so there are a lot of confusing things if you want to optimize the data in this way. And you can imagine when we go to even more complicated objects, like objects in higher loops or objects for even more particle scatterings, then the thing could get even more confu confusing. And so there's a general question of how can we augment the data so that the physical information can be the clearest as possible. Now, uh, there is a, and, and this is the kind of question that we would like to ask. Of course, uh, the, usually what people do is to first compute whatever they can get from the integral and then try to model the expression. That's not a very smart way. But what we would really would like to see is that whether, here's a general question, whether we can start from any Fermi integral in the form as we can read off directly from Fermi diagrams, and just by staring at these integrals, whether there's a method to extract the physical information directly out. That's a general target we would like to achieve. So what's the end of your expression? Sorry? Am I supposed to know what's the LI or whatever you wrote down there? Oh, okay. So, so yeah, just to, to explain a little bit, that this is a neural log function. No, I know this I wrote this. LI one. is the dialog Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. I'm going to illustrate this more in detail later on. Anyway. Mm -hmm. So these are either just a dialog or a product of two logs. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Usually, you can associate weight one for log and weight two for dialog. And in that sense, the whole function has uniform transcendental weight two. If this is a usual saying about these functions. Oh, good. So, we would like to see whether we can be able to extract physical information directly from the Fermi integrals. That's the general target. But before really going to that, let me uh, first do a little bit of review about the technique that people recently introduced into the field of scattering amplitude that makes this whole story a lot simplified. Uh, the, the, the method, in general, generally speaking, is to introduce another kind of uh, terminology to express the same expression, which is sort of the same <coughs> as the final function, but yet not quite the same. Let me tell you how to do this. So let's Take just this dialog function as an example. Say so just as, as something as simple as dialog of B. This is almost like the simplest kind of function that you can encounter beyond log functions. Yet it's different from log. And in one definition, you can think about this dialog as a sort of iterated integral defined in this way. You have a twofold integral uh, associated to y and x, and in the range when i is bigger than zero but smaller than x, and x is smaller than b in the real slice. And then in the integral, you put something like a d log of one minus y times d of log x. So it, with this definition, you can explicitly complete the integral, and perhaps first by setting v to be some real values between 0 and 1 in order to safely do the computation. And then afterwards, you can do uh, an analytic continuation as you want. But according to this definition, let's do a simple translation. Also, there's also a minus sign here, overall minus sign. Now let's uh, do a small trans translation. But let's associate a map, which we call S, acting on this function. And then correspondingly, we basically read out something that looks very much like this integral. I write minus, then 1 minus z, and uh, introduce a notation, which is just a, basically a way to distinguish a two part of in this expression. Uh, 1 minus c cross 
Z. And these are basically just the argument in entering the two log. And the sequence is in correspondence with the sequence in which you do the, the iterated integral. And this is what people normally call the symbols associated to these transcendental functions of weight two. And in this sense, the weight, roughly speaking, is just a number of entries in your expression. And uh, also equivalently, say this is the number indicating how many integrals iterate, uh, how, how many integrals you need to do in order to get from a rational function to such a transcendental function. So in this case, there are two fold integrals that you need to do, and these are all transcendental weight two. Okay. Now there is something very nice that satisfied by. Uh, this kind of notation, although it's just a net current notation. So first of all, if you are just thinking about the regime of uh, all uh, iterated integrals, then if you consider some symbol like this, so you have all the other entries, but say in one particular entry, you have something like x times y, the euro product. And then for this one, you can actually decompose it into two parts, one only involving x and another only involving y. So the higher symbols I'm supposed to think of uh, yeah. just higher logarithms? Or? Right, okay, yeah. Let's give you more examples. So we can think about more general, general classical polylog, which is weighted as by m. Then in this way, the standard symbol is just minus 1 minus d. Then all the other entries are just these. And uh, they are all together n minus 1 to these, correspondingly. And maybe that's one more example. If you have something like log x normal times normal uh, times another log of y, then if you, sorry, if you think about its, your symbols, then this is x times y plus y times x. These are two very basic examples that you can consider. Now, if you have more compli complicated functions, you can get even rational functions inside the symbol entries after direct translation. For example, if you put some rational function here. And then you may encounter this situation. And then if you have that, you, can, you are free to do this. And this can be easily understood from the fact that this side is directed from the integer, which is a rational thing. Now, also, if in some simple entry you encounter just a just a number, then you can basically uh, turn this into there. For example, if you have a minus sign here and extract a minus one, and that's just a sign. Now, if, after we have this machinery, we can try to study the symbols of this guy and then uh, do this algebraic manipulations, and the whole stuff will get shrinked remarkably. So, let me give you directly what the result is. So, the symbol of this guy is as simple as the following expression beta u minus 1 or beta u plus 1 times beta u b minus beta u over beta u b plus beta u. And times another, uh, plus another term where you basically just switch the row between u and b. This is not at all obvious from the function itself. And so, after you get this, you may wonder whether this really brings something nice to us. And the answer is yes, in particular, if you just want to get a knowledge about where the branch cut locates and what the, what the associated discontinuity as that follows. So take the, still take this dialogue as, a, as an example. We know that for this dialogue, it has a branch cut from one to infinity. And from the symbols, that just the fact that 
you can, uh, when you identify this one minus C as zero, it tells you where the front cup is. And then when you want to study the discontinuity of this dialog function, we know that it's proportional to log of D uh, up to some trivial uh, numerical fact, uh, pre -factor. And from the symbols, it doesn't matter that we want to chop out the first entry. And so at the triple symbol level, that just means we only need to chop out the first one. And whatever remains, is the symbol of the discontinuity. Maybe just more generally say, if you look at this, you chop out the first entry, then you're left with a bunch of these. And these are exactly the symbols of a log b to n minus, n minus one power. And that's exactly the discontinuity of this uh, original function. So that's a very general phenomenon, uh, actually a very general fact associated to the symbols. And you can always analyze it in this way. Well, how, when, since when is this known? Sorry? This is known from where? Oh, uh, actually the symbology, uh, the, the, the method of using symbols are actually developed around the 1990s by mathematicians. And that's a very general method to do to analyze the structure of a very big generalization of the classical polylogs. So more generally, you can talk about what is called multiple polylogs, or equivalently the so-called Gontero polylogs. And the symbols are actually introduced by the mathematician Gontero, such a Gontero. And why is this happening? Why is it working? Is there some way to see that, or are you going to explain that? Uh, you mean why the discontinuity mean, operation corresponds to this? I mean, this thing has some very magical properties that you're now basically giving an abstract algebra for. Yes, yes. And temporarily, I'm just review, trying to quickly review that so you can understand what we are going to do. Because we are heavily relying on the use of symbology. Yeah. I, I, thought I, I thought I remembered something that the, the symbol throw away some information. Yes, yes, right. How do I see that here? Or, or uh, for away? example, so in general, after some integrals, you can guess, say, at, at level transcendental weight 2, apart from this function, sometimes you can also get something like a pi squared over 2, like right here. Right. And now, of course, when we transmit the symbols, we're just throwing away this kind of information. OK, but that yeah. means, uh, is it just constants, or is it more than OK, that? At, at, higher, at, uh, at higher weights, it could be some constant times other things. Is, for example. Okay. Definitely there are things that we are throwing away. Okay. But the point is that the most essential structure of the function okay. is encoded in the symbols. And that's the most important thing we care about. Right. So that's, that's why I, in the beginning I said this is something analog to the functions but not quite. However, uh, at weight 2 and 3, there are actually ways so that when you, uh, when you, when you, obtain, when you know about the symbols, you can basically recover the entire function at weight two and three. But then at weight higher than three, there are some issues arising and things become not so clean. But, but that's some subtle data that we don't want to care about for the time being. Question. Um, at higher weight, could the information you throw away also include information about branch cuts and similarities? Let me see. Like with that example you gave, uh, pi over two times a function, huh? which itself has a branch cut. Good. Branch so maybe let me put it in this way. Suppose we don't associate any weight to the pi. Then I, although I'm not quite sure concretely for time being, but I think in that case we won't throw information about the branch cut. But I need to check. Very good question. If you don't associate the weights. I think so, yeah. But I'm currently not 100% sure. <laughs> good. Yeah, so the so, so this is one thing we can do to the functions, and there's a nice correspondence between the symbols and the original function. And you can basically interpret this operation as acting from the left each time you chop off the, the first entry, 
And you can also study the discontinuity across some branch cut of the origin of the first discontinuity. And for that, you just basically chop the first entry one by one until you zoom the ends in the end. And that corresponds to just a rational function. Now, apart from these continuities, we can also talk about taking differentiations of the original function. And for example, it, for this function, it's basically just the log of uh, 1 minus c. And uh, as you can see, explicitly, in terms of the symbols, we start from this one, and then we just chop off this one, the last entry. Of course, in reality, things could be more complicated, like we can have some rational functions of D. Then what really happens is that when you, when you do that, the differentiation, when it acts on the symbol, that gives you the remaining, thing, remaining part of the symbol. But in front, you get a non-trivial coefficient, which is just a derivative acting on the log of the last entry. So when you study some uh, the symbol, some functions, say like the symbol i, and when you take the differentiation, the general structure you would see is that you get a summation over uh, lower transcendent functions of lower transcendental weight. Say if I start from a weight n, we get functions of weight n minus one. But then for each of them in front, we can get some b, b log or some, some other log, rational functions. And this is an important structure for this kind of iterated integrals that we see. And especially if the coefficient is truly d log of some other guy, but without any further rational coefficients, in this case, we call the function, we call that these functions are pure functions. This is some terminology that I frequently use here. So for example, if I don't care about this overall coefficient, then this box integral is a pure function in that sense. And uh, at the function level, that, that uh, means that uh, you just you only get some trivial numbers as a coefficient. So this is basically all we need to, all we need for this talk uh, in regarding the symbols. And so uh, our problem of trying to understand the singular singularity structure of the Feynman integrals turns to a problem of trying finding a method to understand the entire structure of the symbols associated to those functions. And this is our target. Good. Now, we also need to set up some constructs to talk about these Feynman integrals. As they are originally defined in terms of Feynman diagrams, of course, for loop integrations, we need to integrate over the entire space of the loop momenta. And uh, that's a highly non trivial thing. And so, in order to make things much nicer, uh, one idea that we use here is to go back to the very old stuff to go to the Feynman parameters. There are some particular reasons that we want to start from this point, which I'm going to illustrate. But firstly, uh, let's quickly review what uh, the final parameters are, in case you are not working in this with it frequently. So here, let me just focus on, uh, OK, it doesn't really matter. So basically, for final parameters, uh, the, there's a whole machinery uh, which can be applied basically to any Feynman integrals. What you essentially need to do is to translate each of the Feynman propagator to a representation in terms of Schwinger parameterization. Something like this. And now after you go to the Schwinger parameterization, you can actually to, uh, rotate to the Euclidean region and trivially uh, perform the loop integral that give you something. And then to land on the Feynman parameter, we just need to basically put a neural scale for all the parameters, and then integrate that scale away. And that gives us some integral of a rational function. And since not all the loop integra integrations are totally performed, the only integrations we are left 
or the integration of the final parameters. And in this talk, let me use the x variables for the final parameters. And so in general, for a final parameter, say it temporarily, if we don't care about any non-trivial numerator structure, then what we get is that some structure obtained obtain from the diagram itself. And uh, the thing that we can directly obtain, for example, maybe to be, to be clear, let's just focus on one loop. In which case, we only get a n gong for n particles. And so there are explicitly n propagators, and so all the other n fundamental parameters. Of course, they are constrained by the delta function. And then uh, the, in the remaining thing, we get some rational function, which roughly can be coded as a polynomial v, a polynomial u over another polynomial v. These are usually called the graph polynomials or semantic polynomials associated to the graph. And that can be obtained read out from by a standard radical rule. So let me tell you how to do this. And further, there are some powers. So just for, just as an exercise, let's uh, obtain the climate parameterization tradition for this particular example. So for the, for the U part, we just need to study all possible cuts that cut the uh, dibook diagram into an entire tree diagram. And correspondingly, there are, there are four cuts associated to each edge. Let me give each edge a label. One, two, three, four. And so the U polynomial is just a sum over all the cuts, which in this context is summing over from S1 up to S4. And then for the polynomial that stays downstairs, we just need to study all the possible cuts that separate the graph into two trees. And so here we need to sum over things like x, y times x2, x, y times x3, and so on, all possible choices. And then for each cut, we need to also associate to it the corresponding mental step in the channel. However, there are only two non-trivial uh, cha non -non channels, and so we have only two terms here. That corresponds to x1 times x3, and also x2 times x4. And correspondingly, we have the s minus 10 variables, and the other one, t, for these two polynomials. And the rule can be generalized, but let me not go to that complication in this talk. Uh, a further thing here is that when the propagator have mass, in the denominator, we actually need to add some additional term, which is just uh, minus u times the summation over all legs, uh, all, all propagators, and the corresponding mass. And so, correspondingly, here we need to deform v to, to really put the v minus u squared times n squared in the denominator. Okay, let me put it more clear. In the denominator. And then there are some power contents. Uh, but maybe in this talk, let me just directly give you. That for this particular setup, this is true. And then there's a true numerator. And this is a integrand that sits into the final parameterization in our case. This U and V the same as the U and V do have the Sorry? This U and V is not the same as the U and V do have the Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a bad notation. Sorry. Let me put this to be the big one. Actually, I need another notation. Yes, yes. Good. So this is something that is familiar from a long time ago, but there is something that may not be very familiar to everybody. So here is the follows, which is actually very important here. So usually when you see a primary primary tradition, there is an explicit delta function constrained in the region of the final parameters. But actually, in some sense, this, this delta function is only to set up a particular gate choice for the whole integral. And the whole integral essentially is the projective uh, in the following sense. So we can try to put the rescale the all the variables 
uh, with, with the same risk building, and then the whole integral has to be remaining variant. And actually, more generally, for this Dela function, instead of putting this constraint, you can also put the constraint so the, to associate a positive number to each of the variables, and uh, the whole integral should also remain the same. And even a ni an even nicer way to consider the integral is the following. So in here we are just consider a an affine space and the particular region there, but uh, and effectively there are only n minus one integrations here. But instead we can think about a a certain form in top form in uh, C p n minus one, and consider the integration to be a certain simplex in the real slice of this space, and uh, integrate a top form in this space. And when we translate into that language, the only thing we need to do is to do a slight uh, re rewritten of this uh, universal part. So there what we need to do is to apply the standard measure for that projected integral, which in the, in the context of scalar amplitude really lies like this. And so you think about this big X as the homogeneous coordinates formed by X1, X2, up to Xn. And then for the measure, we just set up a bunch of X and N dx and contract them using the Levitch beta tense symbol. And this this is that is what this notation means. And then, the first delta function is really just making sure your n-gon closes, is that correct? Sorry. Is, that the, is that the Feynman parameterization equivalent of saying that your n-gon is closed? Oh. Uh, this delta function that you started with. Why? Because you're replacing it with, uh, you're saying you're replacing it with uh, an integral over uh, a simplex inside of CPN. Mm -hmm. and oh, it's in this. This connection is not quite necessary. So maybe just for a more general example, you can consider two loops. Uh, I do have uh, even more uh, parameters, but it's yeah. still a single one. Yeah. And so after that, you basically just write the remaining parts. However, since we are considering this uh, compact coordinates, then actually what this turns into is nothing but uh, a certain quadrant in the in the projected space. And then what we do is basically integrate over a certain simplex on the real slice. And in this example, it's a pretty standard one. Uh, the simplex is basically just defined by uh, specifying the boundaries that uh, each of them is defined by a certain x i equals zero. And that's the region that we consider. Okay. So we sort of extract a, a mathematical object from this Feynman integration, which by appearance seems to be, it seems that we can generalize it by considering even more general quadrant, although what we get here is a very special one. And uh, the dimension depends just on the number of labs we have in this particular case. And we can think about what's the structure of this object. More generally, uh, at one loop, uh, we can. We, it is possible that we get more complicated numerators even sitting upstairs, but we can get even more higher powers downstairs. But the weight of counting the number of x, the degree of x, is always cancel, is always balanced between the numerator and the denominator. So that the fact that these are uh, this is a projective integral is satisfied by all from you get from any type one. You always get a essentially an object in the project space. And you can always translate into this uh, this kind of form, except that we might also have some complicated tensor structures. The temporary that's not worry about that. The you scale one of the x's and just one of them, doesn't it? You said that the whole thing should be in vain. Right? So when did, when did you say that? So maybe let me put that like this. So most generally, you can think about applying the general linear transformation to the entire set of x variables. Oh, so Any transformation, because this is essentially a project is object that has to be invariant. 
But another, this is one essential point about the function parameterization. Another essential point for our talk here is that at one loop, no matter what complicated object you start with, in the denominator, you always get that quadrant. It's that this is some certain quadrant that has to be specified. And this is uniquely determined by the, by the graph, only by the graph that we start with. And possibly uh, also depending on whether we could mass on the propagator, but that's all. So starting from this setup, it looks like we can try to find something that is very, can be applied to very general uh, stuff. And that's a general hole. So now let me show you how can, can we actually do this. So now let, let me assume that, temporarily assume that I'm not really considering any particular domain integral, but just think about this object with a very general Q and a very general same class. And these are the only unique uh, geometric object in the space that defines our integral. So already by that, we can expect that for whatever functions we get on the integral, that function has to depend, only can depend on the geometry itself, but not any other redundant data. So that's a general expectation. Now, to make things nicer, let me define the following uh, family of objects. Let me call them O and uh, labeled by N, say. Uh, this N does not necessarily mean the, the, the number of labs, just to distinguish. So for this N, uh, I'm considering some integral in two N minus one dimensions. So correspondingly, to the measure, I need to prove this function. Still, let me not consider any numerators, but to balance the x, number of weight of x, I need to put n powers of the quadratic downstairs. That's the first family of objects. Then associated to it, let me define another sequence object, which I call E, which corresponds to an even dimensional integral. But instead, I, I need to put an extra linear factor upstairs in order to make the weight of x to be even. And then I can balance the weight by putting n minus 1 powers, n plus 1 powers of the quadrant. And so these two objects are very well defined in the quadrant space. Now, since these are already interesting because we observe them in natural physics, and so it would be very good if you can get a whole control, complete control over the structure of this integral. The starting point is to is by uh, figure observing that these e functions are nothing but the functions of the O and pi. Here by this notation, let me be more clear. Whenever I, I write an e of O, I either refer to these integrals themselves or any integrals that can be uh, objects that can can be applied obtained by uh, making linear summations of them. So in general, I'm considering some element in the whole uh, vector space. Why this is true? That is mainly because this integral entering to the E object themselves are actually a total derivative of something else. This is how we can identify them. So when we have these integrals, the integrand actually nothing but the d of something. What, it, what are these? Uh, let me just give you the result. Uh, in, the, in the numerator, we have similar structure uh, with, with one less dx. And then in the remaining part, to soak up the contraction, we need a vector. And if temporarily I'm assuming that the O's and the Q are not degenerate, then I can think about uh, its inverse acting on L to make up another vector. And now I just need, for the remaining thing, I just need to balance it by putting one less power. It turns, it so it turns out that the differentiate, total uh, exterior derivative of this lower form turns into exactly this form that we begin with. And so by this fact, we can directly pull the integration onto the boundaries summing over all the boundaries of the original simplex, 
which is now in one lower dimension, and we just pull the corresponding form onto that boundary. When we pull that onto that, of course, we need a set of new coordinates on, just on the boundary. And uh, if temporary lambda again use the x for the coordinates on it, then uh, the only thing that we need to care about is the uh, overall coefficient, which in this case is nothing but q contract with uh, h for the boundary, contract with q inverse, contract with l. And then for the remaining thing, it's pretty standard. Apart from the fact that the, this Q should be understood as the pullback of the original Q onto the boundary. Now, now you can see that apart from this overall rational factor, the integral that we get is nothing but the, of the old time. So this is, a, this is a linear summation. And so we are basically done with the E object. And the only purpose is to understand what the O's are. Now, there's a very uh, nice story about the O objects themselves. Uh, but to make it explicit, let me slightly redefine it by putting a proper normalization. That, that prefactor comes out of the integral, right? Well, which one? This one? <coughs> X-independent, isn't it? This is not dependent on the X. Uh, so no, this does not depend on that. This only depends on the parameters entering the definition of the quadrant. So that means you can pull it out? Yes, yes, exactly. I, yes, okay. I can pull it out. Right. Right. But this is just some rational coefficient. Now for the old object, let me slightly redefine it by putting this normalization. And here you can see that after we put this, you can really rescale the Q and the integration has to be pretty fair. That's the first thing. But the more remarkable thing is the follows. Now we can take our, uh, sorry, I wiped that out. We can think about the differential operator acting on the integral itself, like to take derivative respect to some entries of Q. So we, let's do it, some certain differential operator. I'll not specify which specific operator it is. You can put anything you want. What happens is that, of course, you can first pull it in, inside the integral, and then after it hits on the uh, in the hits onto the integrand, what happens is that the result turns into a total derivative again. And by the intuition here, we can roughly guess what it is. Although you need, you need to, of course, verify it explicitly. So first of all, there's still this factor which can be either put outside or inside, doesn't matter. And then we also need to cook up some additional vector, which in this case, oh, sorry, maybe let me be more specific here. Let me introduce the notation of delta, which is a rank two tensor, contract with the uh, derivative with respect to some q. And now here, what we need is a Q inverse, contract with the delta, <coughs> contract with another X. And now we basically write the remaining thing similarly. So now we can put it onto the co-dimensional one boundary. Let me even put a label for each of them. And so, I have this coefficient. And then we put out this vector again in a similar way as here. So we can check HI with the, this vector. And then, there's the remaining stuff. But now, uh, what we can notice that is that this integral itself turns into a type of the EN because of this linear factor and the inner dimensions. And so we know this is again a total derivative, and we can even put it again onto the co-dimensional two boundaries. And so as a general result, what we get is a summation over the co-dimensional two boundaries. For each of them, we can roughly label by I and J, either any two pairs belonging to the dimensional two boundaries. 
apart from some overall coefficient, the remaining integral is again about O n type. But uh, it's just this is not the original O n, but of one less n after we put a proper normalization. Of course, this Q is again the back onto that co-dimensional two boundary. And now, apart from this, there's just the coefficient that depends, depends only on the parameters entering the definition. And from the expression, you can roughly see that part of the structure has to be this. And then there should also be data coming from another boundary, co-dimensional one boundary. Uh, by first up, uh, look, this is some complicated rational function. But the, what, what is remarkable is that it turns out that this is exactly a D log of some rational function. So the question is, what is this? Now, let me not give you the derivation, but directly tell you the result due to the time limit. So there's a very simple rule to find what this is. So remember, for each term, they are labeled by two, uh, two, two integers specifying the corresponding boundaries. So in general, if we consider the, the term labeled by some i and j, then all we need to do is to first compute this bq. And then uh, we cook up this object that we let this cause and let's say define this object called mij, which is hi dot q inverse dot hq. And now we just need to think about this small two by two matrix. And the contract sandwich it by two, back, uh, two copies of a single vector to make up a quadric polynomial. And now we just study the corresponding two roots and uh, calculate their ratios. And this is exactly the argument entering into the D log, corresponding to this coefficient. And uh, maybe even more specialized, in the case that we consider where the reaching are pretty standard, here this object is nothing but the corresponding entry of the Q inverse. So we first just extract the two by two sum matrix of Q inverse and do this computation. What this tells us is that, first of all, this function is a pure function in the sense that I illustrated before. There's no non-trivial rational coefficients to each of the simple terms. Furthermore, this combination is, I mean, also labeled in the corresponding labels. This kind of function is exactly the only first entry, simple entries that you can have in the symbols of this function. In other words, the symbol of this function is nothing but summing over labels, and the, for each term you only have this entry, first entry, then times some remaining states, whatever this left over. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. This is, since we are considering the differentiation, this has to be the very last entry, and not the first one. So we already managed to cover part of the structure we want to have. And then the question is what remains. Of course, the nice thing here is that after this calculation, the object that we land on for each of the co-dimensional boundaries, it by itself is another integral of the same type, but of two lower dimensions, and corresponding to one lower weight. And that has to be associated to exactly this remaining part of each of, each of the simple terms. And since we are starting from the same object, we can basically do the same calculation, but for the new integral. And so this, this gives us an iterated method to start from the right words to the left words, and uh, in the end, it can help us to automatically become, uh, discover the entire symbols for both of these functions. Now, you may ask what happens for more general Fermi integrals. And I've just now I've told you that for more general objects, you may also have some uh, non-trivial uh, coefficients. And the first example is this one. And just to remind you of the physics part, 
this function in general, we can obtain it uh, by studying any n gone integrals in n dimensional space time. For this one, there's again diagrams in n dimensional space. Oh, sorry. Uh, in this case, this should be, sorry, two n gons in two n dimensional space time. Exactly the same n. But then for this guy, we have one more than. These are already two very general classes, but of course still a little bit special. So for more general thing, all, all the difference mainly happens to the numerator. We could get some tensor structure of even higher degree in terms of x. And there what happens is that when you get higher tensors, if they come from finite integrals, then those structures by themselves are already also just some other total derivative of something. And so you can directly put that down to the boundaries again. And then as long as you still have some higher rank tensor structure on the boundaries, you can do this even more. And so in, in, in short, in the, after doing that, in the end, all what you need, what you have is that the combination to this object, and you can have this in those. But uh, this integrated structure is a universal feature for all these integrals that come from the following diagrams. And uh, yes, and uh, also this Q is totally generic. This one. Now, uh, just to use the remaining uh, time, uh, let me think about these problems in another way. So up to now, I've only talked about studying the structures by studying the structure of the. Differential, uh, differential operator acting on the object. But alternatively, we can also study what happens if we consider some branch cuts over across some, uh, some discontinuity across some branch cuts. Could you clarify some things for me? I mean, one thing is the, the example you started with was not exactly either of these, right? Because of the, the different powers of n in the numerator and denominator. For example, in the example you wrote down, it was of type O n. You mean this one? Equal to, yeah. Oh, so oh. this one is the. Let me see. The O n. It's n. O n equal to. But n equal two. But then in that in the example you gave, you still had a sum over uh, two n minus one x's. Oh, that is that. You one. mean this object? This are O n O one. The, no, the end on that you erased, that was that was just n equal to? Oh, that one, no, th this can be any end on. Of course, here it's restricted, restricted to even end ons. But in that example, you, when you explicitly wrote down the, the integrand, you oh, had yeah. a quadric in, in the. Yeah, yeah. It's just some other quadric. Oh. Uh, it's just some other okay. quadric. And you can apply the same graphical rule that I talked about. It's just you need to generalize it. But that's some standard common parameter story. Okay. Yeah. So these things really can be used to do this. Right. So so as I emphasize, for whatever, at least at one loop, for whatever thing you start with, two most essential, most essential things. One is that the Fermat parameter integral itself is always a pro integral in a projective space. The second thing is that in the denominator, you always get a certain quadric. It's that you get some quadric that depends on by case by case. But that's always a quadric. But what what is well, the fact here is that the mass, this analysis applies to any quadric. But that's a power of a quadric. Yeah, it's a, you just had a Yeah, it's just some there. power that depends on the number, but the power doesn't really play any essential role. Because it, all its role is to balance the weight so you get a well-defined object in the project, project space. But the quadrant is also a quadrant, always a quadrant. Yeah, maybe I, I should ask this later, but is there a way to organize these O's and E's and your deltas and your D's into a chain complex where some you have a differential? And uh, maybe can we discuss this later? <laughs> 
And just let me use the remaining time to wrap up the story. Uh, so there's a second direction that we can consider. And for this, I'll just give a very brief summary. So we can consider the computing discontinuities. Of course, the discontinuity itself doesn't capture the information about the first symbol, entry symbols. As I said, for this example, all we need to do is to chop it up. But this uh, itself associated to the location of the branch point. But there's a way to read this off directly from the definition of the quadrant. So still, let's consider this object. And the, in the definition, there's only this cube apart from the region. And let's, for, uh, to be simple, let's uh, again put, put the region to be the standard one, defined by all the, any of the variables being there. And there, the data really only enter into the queue. So we just grab the queue itself. From the previous analysis, we roughly get the intuition that for each of the entries inside the symbols, it's always labeled by some particular combination of two cho choices of boundaries. And so it starts similarly. In the first symbol entry, we can first specify some pair of labels i and j. After we fix it, we just consider the two by two minor, the uh, two by two submatrix of the original queue, and do similar computations as what we do here, and now again we just uh, obtain the corresponding ratio of the roots, and this is exactly what enters into the first symbol entry, and in general we have the summation over chaos i and j. Now, the remaining task is to compute this time. But here, the problem becomes that we want to identify which integral actually computes the function that leads to this remaining part. And for that, all what we need to do is to take these two coordinates and do an affine transformation into, say, some uh, y i and y j. The only target that we want is that we want to take the original object into the following form, yi times yj plus 1, find some, some remaining factor, which only depends on the remaining x. So this by itself is again some quadric, but depending only on the remaining variables. After we do this, this combination looks very much like some part entering into the standard form matrix of a sphere. And so correspondingly, one choice we can think about is to first identify these two variables of the complex conjugate, and then integrate each, any of them on the entire complex plane. So we take this counter. We take this counter and perform the completely perform the integral associated with yi and yj. And whatever remaining integral we get, it turns out to be the integral that gives rise to symbols give rise to the remaining part. And that turns out into, to be the, exactly the discontinuity across the branch cut indicated by this factor. And uh, once more, the remaining integral that we get is another integral of the same, uh, same type of function. Uh, which I don't have enough time to show explicitly here, but that's a general fact. And then there are some new quadric entering there, but in lower dimensions. And so we can basically apply, again, this method iteratively to the remaining state to recover the remaining symbols, part of the symbols one by one. And uh, maybe one last comment to draw is that there is a very uh, similar structure entering to the uh, entering into the both algorithm. And that kind of suggests a dual picture associated to the symbols of this type of quadrics and uh, integrals defined by quadric, and maybe also with uh, more general tensor structures in the numerator. Uh, originally, I plan to show you how to explicitly do the calculation using those methods in recovering 
this particular simple structure. But maybe Henry, let me stop here. If people want to know more, I can tell you in, in detail later on. Okay, thanks.